the afternoon session, and um, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Christian Dujon. He is the scientific director at the Dubai Institute for Nanomaterial Science at the, at the University of Madrid. And for 15 years, he was with Shell Research, working on catalyst synthesis, heavy oil conversion, environmental processes, zero light catalysis, and um, synthetic gas production and conversion. And he uh, was appointed as full professor at, uh, uh, in 1997 at the University of Madrid. He, was, he has received a number of Shell and Patent Awards in 1987 and 1991. And just very recently, he gave a brilliant talk um, in Doha uh, about a month ago uh, when he was the recipient of this year's Natural Gas Conversion Awards Award for Excellence. The title of his presentation will be supported with iron and cobalt catalyst, uh, nanoparticle coefficient approach catalyst. Would you please help me welcome Professor uh, Christian Duchamp. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start off by thanking the organizers for putting together such an uh, excellent symposium and also uh, a great festivity, I think, to honor Dr. Bertrand Davis for uh, his eminent uh, contributions to a broad field of uh, catalysis. And I think for many of us it's a pleasure to be here together as friends and colleagues. And we would like to congratulate you on the this occasion and then receiving this uh, prestigious award. Um, in uh, talking about the uh, topic indicated, um, physiotropic catalysis is a topic close to birds' hearts, I might say. And um, just to uh, underline that from level of science, it makes us modest if we note the number of publications. And I just took, let's say, roughly speaking, the last two decades. Uh, the number of publications on the one hand on iron uh, physiotropic catalyst, on the other hand on cobalt physiotropic catalyst. And in some years, for example, in 2011, I think in total iron and cobalt together he published more papers on physiotropes than many of us throughout our career. So that's, uh, that makes us um, modest in view of his great contributions, not only in quantity but also in quality. I think he inspired many of us um, to realize the important features of cobalt catalyst deactivation, for example, iron carburization and the impact on mechanical stability, and so on and so forth. So uh, today I would like to build up on that and, and talk about iron and cobalt for physiotropic catalysis, first of all with introducing the topic and then moving to cobalt and briefly to iron. Since this gas conversion, it has been said uh, also this morning, Versatile in the sense that the synthesis gas, a mixture of CO and hydrogen, can be produced from a wide variety of feedstocks and give us a wide variety of products. If you go for cobalt catalyst, we will make mainly alkanes as products and water, in the case of iron, alkenes, and CO2. Well, in the career of Dr. Davis, it was clear that the main, his main effort in the early 90s was on iron and later on more or less shifted to cobalt. I will do the, the other way around and discuss first cobalt and later on something on iron. Supported metal nanoparticles will be the focus of this talk. Uh, so let's briefly introduce that topic, realizing that in a macroporous support body, uh, millimeter size for fixed bed or micrometer size, tens of microns for slurry bed or fluid bed catalysis, we can zoom in and realize that we have support particles, let's say some tens of nanometers, and dispersed on that support particles, let's say in the, in the size range, one to 20 nanometers. And if we consider metal nanoparticles, we need to consider individual properties, and today I will touch not on all of these properties, but I will mention something on composition, size, and support. In particular for the cobalt, we will dwell a bit on that topic of the support influences. And on the other hand, next to, you might say, individual properties, we also consider what I like to call collective properties. So the behavior of a large ensemble of nanoparticles, which has impact on a number of parameters, 
But for this talk, I will mainly focus on the distribution of nanoparticles over the support. And to illustrate what I'm hinting at is here a TEM image of a silica support. This is 50 nanometers of steel bar. So the primary silica particles are about 20 nanometers or so. And I dispersed uh, or have drawn about 50 nanoparticles dispersed over this area of the support in three fundamentally different ways. One is what I call high density domains of nanoparticles. One is clusters where the particles interact directly with each other and uniform distributions of nanoparticles. And this has an impact, and we will discuss this for cobalt and also for iron, how this affects the performance of these catalysts. We uh, need a few research tools in order to be able to contribute at a fundamental level to this field, and just briefly highlighting those research tools. So we use uh, the synthesis method of impregnation and twining, and this morning we learned we can use metal clusters and many other techniques, but still I think it's fair to say that this is a very important technique, and to understand that at a fundamental level is one of our thrusts. So we discriminate between impregnation uh, of the solution onto the support, then drying to evaporate the solvent, which gives us the supported uh, metal salt, for example, nickel nitrate in this case, and after calcination or thermal treatment, we get metal oxide particles on our support, and after reduction, we observe the metal nanoparticles, and also I should emphasize that the group of Dr. Davis has contributed uh, a lot to the understanding, for example, of the reduction step and the addition of noble metal promoters. I won't go into that specifically, but mainly talk about the, uh, the drying step and the effects of that on the uh, performance and the distribution of the nanoparticles. We use model supports. Uh, for example, order means of order silica, like MCM41 and FDA15, with the means of course well ordered with respect to each other. Uh, in this case, FDA15 with 9 nanometer cores uh, is something that assists us to derive fundamental relationships, you might say synthesis, structure, performance relationships. Electrotomography is in our toolbox to derive, uh, and again it was introduced this morning, this problem if you have a cluster of nanoparticles, and we have a transmission electron microscope, the electron beam will go through the cluster and it will observe the projection of the cluster, which makes it very difficult to uh, derive quantitative data of particle-particle distances from, uh, this, uh, from this projection. So what we do is multiple projections, thereby fill up the, after Fourier transformation, the three-dimensional Fourier space, and inverse Fourier transformation gives us the possibility to numerically calculate the three-dimensional object. And the fourth one is, of course, catalysis. We need catalysis. Uh, this is uh, from a Avancium in so-called Florence units with these uh, typical conditions uh, up to 550 degrees centigrade and 80 bar, also in syntax and online GC analysis. The 16 parallel reactors are in four blocks that we can heat independently. So um, we can uh, select four different temperatures, but within one block, the temperature is really warm. So that's about the tools. Now let's move to cobalt. And uh, for cobalt, uh, we have studied the following phenomena that I would briefly uh, like to highlight with you. We will study the effect of aggregation of cobalt particles in cobalt silica systems, then the effect of the synthesis method on the performance of titanium supported cobalt catalysts, and finally something on neodia supported cobalt catalysts. <coughs> well, the catalyst preparation that we used in case of the silica support was that we first started with a model support, an SPA 15, so the ordered mesoport materials with this given port volume and port diameter of 9 nanometers, and we used an incipient wetness impregnation technique with a concentrated cobalt nitrate solution. 
I will focus after the drying step where we apply cryo-electron tomography in order to prevent decomposition of the cobalt nitrate in the electron beam. We heard also about beam damage this morning. One way to prevent it is to cool your sample to 77 Kelvin in the electron microscope. And the dried sample we will study with electron tomography. So we will jump, and I will not go into these details, I will use uh, another support for that, but just to highlight the impact of drying on the distribution of metal nanoparticles in supported capital. Here is the structure of the system. So this is uh, an SBA 15 particle, in this case with the electron beam parallel to the pores. In this case, the electron beam perpendicular to the pores, but this is from one and the same electron tomogram. So what we will do, and I will start the movie now, we will travel through this particle with the means of force in this direction, and every position of the bar, we see an orthogonal cross cut from the electron tomogram uh, in, in the SV50 particle. And what we clearly can see is that some bright spots are there, and the bright spots essentially are empty pores. But we also have uniform gray areas over a number of pores, and those are heavily loaded with cobalt nitrate. So clearly what we observe is that the cobalt nitrate has been deposited as flux, nano flux, you might say, or nano rods of cobalt nitrate over a number of pores, while other pores are empty over large distances. You can also see it here, this is empty pore with filter pores. We can prevent that because this is after conventional drying, 60 degrees centigrade, typically we dry, and then we get this patchwise or clubwise deposition. If we carry out freeze drying, so we pull the sample to liquid nitrogen temperature, slowly heat it up, then we get a very uniform distribution of our cobalt nitrate. So clearly we can prevent the problem, but it's cumbersome, of course, freeze drying is technically not so difficult, but it takes a long time. So what we did is that uh, Tamara Ennehuizen was working on this model support and uh, used the freeze drying that another PhD student, Peter Wunnick, started to work with the industrial silica gel support and varied the drying temperature, but perhaps even more importantly, the hydrodynamics of the system. He moved from stagnant drying, which is usually in, a, in laboratory, at laboratory scale, people impregnate the catalyst, put it in a muffled furnace, come back the next day, and take it out. That's the drying in many, many cases. Well, we use the fluid bath, so that controls more, uh, gets you more uniform conditions for each individual macroscopic particle. And then they measure the fission jobs of thousands of 20 bar. So let's first have a look. We need, because it's now in, in uh, a silicon gel, we need an ultra microtone uh, section in order to be able to get good images. Uh, uh, and that is what we observe here. We see the different conditions. The scale bar in all cases is 250 nanometers. And this is not a single particle, but rather it is a uh, cluster of many, many hundreds of nanoparticles. In all cases, the CO3 or 4 crystallite size is about 10 nanometers. So there's no variation in crystallite size at this stage of the, the, uh, the, of the drying and calcination in this case. But it is rather a distribution in aggregate size. So these are huge aggregates of about 200 nanometers. It's about 15 nanometers, 20 nanometers. And then, in this case, the aggregate size is close to the particle size. Sometimes we have a few particles together, but many of them are isolated. So we can control the aggregate size, and the question is what is the impact on catalysis? So I'll jump straight away to the results, because time is short. So here are the conditions, 20 bar, 240 degrees C, etc. CO conversion is varying between 30 and 50 percent. And this is the weight time yield. So the, uh, while the cobalt loading is the same, but it's expressed per gram of catalyst. And what we see as a function of time is that there's a significant variation uh, of the, uh, in both the initial and the months, almost steady state activity after some 200 hours. And clearly with the isolated nanoparticle you get significantly higher activities compared to the very large aggregates. 
Well, since we apply the quite severe reduction, this may be a, a, an impact via the reduction rather than the catalysis. However, it also seems that the most significant deactivations are apparent with the, the catalyst with the lowest activity. And that's something that intrigues us, and therefore we study now more extensively the deactivation behavior of these different systems. Uh, of course, in FT, C5 cluster activity is key. Uh, we don't want the methane, often we don't want the C2, C4. We prefer the liquid products, and the liquid products are C5 plus. So this is C5 cluster activity from 72 to 82% plotted here as a function of this aggregate size. And there seems to be a rough correlation uh, with aggregate size, although some people may say a horizontal line would do as well. But the points that deviate are either uh, because of very high conversion in this case or low conversion because of the lower activity of the large aggregates. So we have to work this out further, but it demands us, on the one hand, this conversion effect, of course, is, is, is known. And for example, very recently, Ramini Boukour has published about that. But another one that's very important, and the Holman Group uh, has published that a few years ago, that if these aggregate sizes, or then they, they refer to the primary particle sizes, uh, were larger, that the C5 plus selectivity went up. And what we noted is that the paraffin to all, the olefin to paraffin ratio that's plotted on the right hand axis increases with aggregate size. So it seems to be that we have a more olefinic product in the case of larger aggregates, and of course that may give rise to secondary reactions and higher C5 plus selectivity. Clearly more work is needed, but I think the observations are very intriguing. Titania. Titania is an important uh, uh, support these days, studied a lot. Of, and, and what we did, we were interested in the method of synthesis, or the method of depositing the cobalt onto the titania. We took a, a classic P25 titania from uh, Evonik, the former uh, Dibusa. And we either deposited via ammonia deposition precipitation, or urea, or the incipient blackness impregnation. Of course, we characterized. Time is lagging to go into all the characterization details. So I'll jump straight away to the catalytic testing using these abbreviations of the uh, ammonia, the urea, and the uh, impregnation uh, methods for the cobalt titania catalysts. First of all, the activity, the cobalt time yield, now plotted uh, per gram of cobalt activity as a function of cobalt loading. Here are the conditions. There's some variation in, in uh, conversion. I think the maximum was about 20 to 40 percent CO conversion. And what we observe is that uh, there's a clear advantage of this ammonia uh, precipitation method, which has been patented, patented by Johnson Matty. Martin Locke was one of the inventors of that. Uh, where it's clear that, that intermediate loadings is a great benefit, probably through dispersion. Uh, from our characterization, it's mainly a dispersion effect. When we go to high loadings, it more or less converges, more or less gets independent of the method we use. Surprisingly, the C5 plus selectivity, and this would have been weight percent, the C5 plus selectivity consistently is significantly higher for the HDA catalyst. Partly because of uh, a conversion effect, but the conversion effect is much more than this very significant effect that we measure uh, for, uh, for this series of catalysts. So this is for us uh, now uh, a topic of study. What's going on? It's cobalt and titania, no promoter, no. It's, uh, there are dispersion differences. Uh, but higher dispersions usually give you lower C5 plus selectivity, also studied by the Holman group in the past, and I think it's not straightforward to assign this to, to a dispersion. So it may be distribution, it may be something, uh, the activation of the titania, that's something that we are currently studying. Um, last topic for cobalt is Neomia supported cobalt catalyst. Uh, we had some, some uh, interesting uh, observation with Neobia. It builds up on earlier work at uh, University of Rio de Janeiro. Um, Richard Small and, and others uh, have studied that uh, quite some time ago to use Neobia as, as 
as a support animal, they found that you need to have crystalline neobia. The amorphous neobia gives you low activities. So we followed that work and carried out the crystallization of neobia at elevated temperatures, which implies you have a low surface area support, which seems a poor proposition for an FT catalyst, and usually you would require higher metal loadings. Uh, and of course, you can achieve high metal loading by multiple impregnations, but still the dispersion of the cobalt will go down. And to illustrate that problem, if you have 11 weight percent of cobalt, this is the neobia uh, particles, quite large, something like 100 nanometers in size. And here are clustered cobalt particles um, that are, of course, uh, I think this is to Solus has once called them graveyards for catalysis. And um, uh, so that's not a very good uh, uh, proposition. So what we did, we stuck with, we, we uh, choose to go for five weight percent cobalt to prevent this this uh, agglomeration of the cobalt nanoparticles. If we then plot the weight time yield, so per gram of catalyst, as a function of temperature, the cobalt neobia with 5% cobalt, of course, has, has no chance uh, to, to compete with 25 weight percent of cobalt or gamma aluminum, uh, or the, uh, let's say, the, the classical uh, uh, gamma aluminum supported cobalt catalyst that we studied so much also by, uh, by Bertram Davis and this group. Uh, the uh, activity is, is, is very higher. It, it's, uh, there's a plateau because of um, the very high CO conversion that we, that we achieve at the highest temperatures. Again, it's not only activity, it is selectivity. So if we plot here the selectivity, there's methane on the one hand and C5 plus on the other. And consistently, the C5 plus selectivity of cobalt on Yobia is much higher for, uh, for uh, is much higher than the C5 plus selectivity on gamma alumina. And our proposal is to harvest that high selectivity in the sense that if you put a certain target, let's say uh, around 80% or so, you can run the cobalt Yobia catalyst at much higher temperatures then you can operate the cobalt on gamma aluminum. And that's summarized in this plot. So if we take now the weight time yield, so per gram of catalyst on the vertical axis, and the C5 plus on the horizontal, and we take 80% as a target, you see that both catalysts more or less give the same weight time yield. In other words, I can operate cobalt neobia at higher temperatures, thereby compensate for the lower metal load. That was what I wanted to say about um, cobalt, uh, since um, Bert extensively contrib contributed to iron uh, fisiotropes catalysis, I, I found it worthwhile to also include a little bit of our work that was uh, to a significant extent inspired by his work, because he showed so well, working also with Datai and others, that cobalt carbide suffers from uh, mechanical disintegration. So what we wanted to do is move to supported iron particles. So the support was a key aspect of our work. The promoters, the particle size, the iron and particle spacing, it was all there. Um, and we applied it for so-called fissure tropes to uh, all of it. Here's a Teresa as Cooper have been contributing and, and, and doing this work. Again, a variety of feedstocks. We make syn gas. And if you want to go to lower offense these days, we go either via methanol, as practiced now in, in China, or we go via FT, uh, the FT NAFTA fraction in particular, because it makes poor gasoline. So that's fantastic steam tracker feedstock. So this is an, both an operation, and this could be an alternative. So we were studying this direct conversion of syn gas to C2 to C4 lower offense. It's a long story, and I have only five minutes to go, so I'll summarize it by saying that it's an integrated approach by su the support selection, the fact that we must prevent uh, uh, aggregation of the iron nanoparticles. I will highlight this point in particular. Control the iron particle size, but also the promoters. And this uh, ends up uh, in, in a catalyst where we have uh, an alpha luna particle of let's say 100 micron, uh, sorry, nanometers or more. And we have iron nanoparticles of 10 to 20 nanometers dispersed over the alpha alumina. The iron particles are promoted by sodium and sulfur, 
I won't go into that, but those promoters are essentially to suppress the methane formation at the elevated temperatures that we apply. And to first then uh, discuss the support effect, then the size effect, and then the aggregation. Well, the support effect in one plot, so if we have the product selectivity, our enemy is methane because we operate, in this case, at 340 degrees centigrade, 20 bar, 340 degrees centigrade, and a hydrogen CO-H of 1, very severe conditions and very high CO conversions for these active characters. Uh, the product selectivity as a function of the catalyst activity per gram of iron. Uh, with this conventional support, our problem is twofold. We have low activity and we make lots of methane. Moving to a support like alpha alumina, carbon nanofibers, carbon nanotubes, as has been published recently by Martin Moore and his group, are much more, get much more active. That catalyst would also drive down the methane and enhance the, the green points or the, the selectivity uh, of uh, to lower offense of the hydrocarbons produced. The iron carbide particle size is very important. If we uh, estimate or calculate uh, uh, a turnover frequency, which is much more difficult with iron, I would say, than with cobalt, or much less straight, it's much less straightforward. But still, in an effort to do that we have these numbers on the vertical axis and the iron carbide particle size using carbon nanofibers as support material we observe an overall increase of the turnover frequency with decrease in particle size. This is very much inverse of what we observe with cobalt. The cobalt that goes down, now it goes up. However, it goes only up for the methane. The methane turnover frequency is indicated here goes up steeply while the turnover frequency for C2 plus products is constant. So it's a clear design parameter, you might say, we want particles that are sufficiently large in order to prevent uh, the contribution of uh, more methane than necessary, you might say. Finally, the, the distribution, uh, the effects of the nanoparticle distribution. Again, our alpha alumina support with particles 100 to 200 nanometers, so typical specific surface area of about 10 square meters per gram. If we impregnate iron nitrate, we observe iron uh, alpha alumina particles that give a very smooth appearance, but it implies there's hardly any iron oxide particles present on that support part. On the other hand, this support part is heavily loaded with iron oxide, as was also confirmed by EDX. If we use ammonium iron citrate as a precursor which has a completely different impregnation, drying, etc. behavior, we see that we get very nice distributions of our iron nanoparticles over the support, much more uniform than in the case of the iron nitrate. Now what we did in a so-called tapered element oscillating microbalance, where we have the possibility to operate a 20 bar under real plug flow conditions, so we have a catalyst band in a hollow rod, and the, the synthesis gas can stream can flow through the catalyst bed under plug flow conditions, we can measure very accurately the mass of our sample under a full catalysis experiment. We have published this uh, recently to be applied for FTO. Again, I have to mention here the work of Duchenne and Anders Holman, who did extensive uh, uh, carbon growth studies, you might say carbon nanofibre growth studies on nickel catalysts with such a system. If we measure now under full FTO conditions, uh, here are the conditions, 350 degrees centigrade, 20 bar, CO-rich synthesis gas, we use very high space velocity to prevent any condensation of products. That's of course important because you always make C5 plus products under FT conditions. And admittedly a short period of time, but still in this short period of time, with iron nitrate catalysts, so same loading, same iron oxide nanoparticle uh, a precursor uh, uh, size of about 20-25 nanometers, a much faster uptake of coke, so this is the amount of carbon, so already something like 15 to 20 weight percent of uh, uh, carbon after six hours on stream, while the ammonium iron citrate with this distribution of nanoparticles gives us a much uh, uh, or substantially less carbon deposited after this 
uh, of six hours of the street. So this is the best catalyst we have now. This is the alpha lumina, this is the electron tomogram, but still we see that we have quite some clustered particles and not only isolated particles, and that may be the reason that we still pick up coke uh, or, or uh, nucleate carbon filaments on, on these clustered particles. That's a future research topic now for us. So um, the cobalt work, uh, the drying method is very important for the cobalt distribution, which affects activity and selectivity, perhaps even stability. Cobalt on titania, we see a tremendous effect on the citrus method. That's a great surprise, more than what dispersion effects can explain as yet. And neobia seems to be an interesting support to operate, in particular at high temperatures. Either we discuss support, size, and promotive effects and also the distribution of the nanoparticles. Um, model supports are important in our work. I think we can learn from those and, and translate like the silica <coughs> to industrial uh, supports. The electron tomography is a powerful tool, in particular if you want to, dis to study distribution effects. And with that, I think that synthesis studies and synthesis of, of catalysts gives us new avenues for synthesis gas catalysis. A lot of acknowledgments for funding the people involved. Uh, our group, in, in, uh, two years ago, we moved to this laboratory, and I think that for a final shot of the video that is being recorded, I thought that this was a nice uh, end, uh, although now you're focusing on me, and I get a bit nervous. Thank you for switching back to the, to the building. Huh? Um, it was really a pleasure and uh, to see you at so many occasions, also at this one. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, and the floor is open for questions. Okay. Did I like the relations now? To the particle size, but finally the chemistry is on the surface, so I feel there's still a little gap in between yes, to understand the effective size and uh, what's happening in different particles themselves. So I wonder, there's a beautiful picture, a picture from Shell, yeah, seeing the structure of the segregated robot. It's uh, something in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. I, I fully agree, so the catalysis is at the surface. That's the reason with the cobalt that we did extensive SIPCA work, because then you measure residence times and coverages of the active species, which are clearly a function of size. And that's exactly what we are now doing also with the iron carbide to sort out what's the difference at the surface and the function of size, because you're absolutely right. Yes. Last row. There was a paper which reported the, the carbon weaknesses on the iron carbide. They could be exercised. Do you have some comments? Uh, there some early evidence or not yet, not yet. Um, because at this stage, what we did was first collect the data, uh, which is already difficult enough to vary the particle size. It's very challenging from a synthesis point of view, narrow particle size distributions, and so on and so forth. But you're absolutely right, um, building on the question of Professor Schultz, that the surface structure is what counts. So you may be right that vacancies uh, and other structural features are um, different and different particle sizes. Thank you. When you move from gamma lumina to alpha lumina, that's that. You have a loss of surface area of the order of 100 or something. How does this uh, is taken? How is this taken into account? How? What is the contribution of the high surface area of gamma lumina, if any? Yeah, what we saw that what we investigated extensively that with the high surface area supports, essentially what happens is the interaction of the iron oxide with the, in this case, gamma lumina or silica is so strong that the carburization that is needed to activate the catalyst does not take place. So we did must bowers spectroscopy, and essentially even at 20 bar, 350 degrees centigrade, 20 bar of syngas, you do not proceed towards the active phase. That 
So if you would use um, not MCM41 or SPA15, but if you had uh, ordered mesoporozeolites, for example, what would be the impact of that? So you have more active support and more uh, acidic support. How would this? For, for the iron? For the cobalt. Oh, for the cobalt? Yes. Um, I, I'm not sure whether you're hinting at secondary reactions to crack the, the, the waxes, or is uh, it... I'm not sure how this would affect the distribution of your nanoparticles or the activity of the catalyst to go to the primary reactions, actually. Right. Well, we didn't study that, so it's a, it's, it's a good question. Uh, Means of course, zero lines are, of course, studied a lot these days. Um, but in general, with um, the very reactive surface that these mesoporous zero lines provide still with the silicon aluminum, etc. With, in, let's say, 10 or 20 bar steam in the reactor, right. uh, yeah, I think that the de-illumination, all the processes would go on under these conditions. Right. Well, uh, because of time, we probably won't have more um, questions at this time, but uh, we may be able to have more questions tonight at dinner. So if you would please help me again, uh, thank Dr. Fritz. Dijon for this wonderful presentation.